shout of praise. Just begin to worship him. Let your praise fill this house. Let your praise fill your homes right now. Hallelujah. 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 He's the God of supernatural increase. He's the God of the turnaround. He's the God of the great breaking loose. Hallelujah. Woo. I decree and declare the body of Christ is breaking loose. Hallelujah, we're the glorious church, full of his glory, full of his power, his presence, his goodness, full of supernatural increased glory to God, full of healing and wholeness.
to just receive it. Receive the fullness of the blessing. Receive that increase. Hallelujah. By faith do we receive it in Jesus' name. Sing it again. Let your kingdom come. Let your kingdom come. And you will be done. As it is in heaven. As it is. opened wide, he's opened wide a new door for us. <laughs> he's opened wide, he's opened wide a new door. It's open wide, he's opened wide, he's opened wide a new door. Right here, right now, he's opened wide, he's opened wide a new door. Come on. He's opened wide, he's opened wide. Walk on in and receive it. He's open wide, he's open wide, a new door. Oh, yes. He's open wide, he's open wide, a new door. Oh, I receive it. He's open wide, he's open wide, a new door unto begin to thank him for it. Thank you, Lord, for the increase. Thank you, Lord, for the blessing. Thank you, Lord, for the covenant that we have with you. Thank you, Lord, for the favor. Hallelujah. He's opened wide, he's opened wide a new door. He's opened wide, he's opened wide a new door. We thank you, Lord. You've opened wide, you've opened wide a new door. We receive it now. You've opened wide, you've opened wide a new door. We receive your increase now. Oh, yes. Just rest over in this truth. Rest over in this truth. He's faithful. He's faithful. He's open wide. Open wide. <laughs> you've opened wide, you've opened wide a new door. We praise you, Lord. You've opened wide, you've opened wide a new door. You've opened wide, you've opened wide a new door. We praise you. How many of you believe God is opening a brand new door? Hallelujah. Come on, give him a shout if you believe it. Amen. Hallelujah. God can open a door when it seems impossible. He can open a door when it seems no door can be opened. We serve a God in whom nothing is impossible. Amen. You don't, be, you don't get to be God if you're limited. He's God, El Shaddai, the God in whom nothing is impossible. Amen. You know, I was thinking this morning as I was praying and preparing for the service about the prophetic word that the Lord gave me on September the 9th last year while I was flying to Australia with Brother Copeland. And he said, in 2020, I will open a new door and caused my faithful ones to experience supernatural increase as never before. Now, I had no idea, you had no idea what we were about to enter into by March of 2020. We had no idea that our nation and practically the world would almost be in total lockdown. How can God do that 
in these kind of circumstances. Well, let me remind you of a, a story in the Bible. You know, the children of Israel were in Egypt, in bondage, 400 years of it. God said he would send a deliverer and that came in the way of Moses. And when God brought them out, Moses had told them, I'm gonna take you to a promised land. It flows with milk and honey. Sounds like supernatural increase. But before they could get there, they had to go through a Red Sea. Of course, a lot of, a lot of them wanted to give up. They wanted to discount or discredit what God had said. How can we go to a promised land that flows with milk and honey when we can't even get past this Red Sea? Since when do Red Seas prevent God from fulfilling his word? Amen. And so when they got to the Red Sea and people began to murmur and complain and in their minds, they've practically given up. In fact, they said to Moses, why did you bring us out here to die? We would have rather stayed in Egypt. At least we had something to eat. This is the same group of people that were begging to get out of Egypt. I think these were the original charismatic Christians. <laughs> Sounds like a bunch of them I've met over the years. Amen. And God said to Moses, tell them go forward. God's instructions are never retreat. Give up, quit. It's all over. Ship your saddle home. No, that's not God's way. He said, tell the people, go forward. And when Moses did what God told him to do, the sea split open. You know the story. And God's people went over on dry ground. Now, there's a verse in Psalm. You'll have to look it up and I'm not going to tell you. This is your homework. There's a verse in Psalm that said God's way was through the sea. In other words, God made a way through what was opposing them. God's way is through this calamity we're going through right now. Amen. I'm not giving up on that new door. I'm not giving up on supernatural increases never before. In fact, it's not unusual for God to take his people to a higher level when everybody else is sinking. Amen. So don't give up on God. Don't give up on his word. We still have a promise. Supernatural increase as never before. God is opening a brand new door. Hallelujah. And I've said it many, many times. You've heard me say it. It's never over until God says it's over and God will never say it's over until we win. Lift your hands and give the Lord a shout. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. I'm going to ask Justin, Eric, Joseph, Rick, all you guys come up, our ministerial staff, come on up. Stand on either side of me. We need one microphone. And I'm gonna ask that we, as your ministerial staff, set ourselves in agreement, not only for this church, but for everybody that's watching by way of live stream. And we're gonna pray in Jesus' name that you are not gonna grow weary in well-doing. That you're not gonna give up, you're not gonna faint. Amen. Amen. 
God's way was through the sea. They couldn't see it at the moment. Who would have thought that God would have made a way in the very thing that was opposing them? God can make a way through this calamity right now. And I believe he's working behind the scenes to do so. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, God, how could you get me my house that I'm believing for? Well, in a situation like this, you can get it a whole lot cheaper. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. 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 God can open a way. Yes. In fact, in situations like this, Amen. it's unlimited. Hallelujah. I keep waiting for a phone call. Brother Jerry, we've just found out that someone owns a Falcon 50 EX that they can't afford to keep anymore. Would you like to have it? Amen. And I'm going to say, yes, amen. Bring it to me right away. Hallelujah. Amen. I can sustain it. Praise God. I can keep it. Praise God. His way is through the sea. Now, that's your homework. Look up that verse in Psalm. I'm not going to tell you where it is. You come back next week, whether I'm here or not, tell Brother Justin. I found it. I found it. <laughs> Amen. And hold on to it. God's way was through the sea. Hallelujah. All right. Justin, pray over everybody. Let's join hands, set ourselves in agreement. Hallelujah. Also in Numbers, it says that they were weary because of the way. So, so the enemy wants to sow discouragement. But God's word is always to bring hope and bring faith. Thank you, Father. So, Father, as a leadership team, as those in authority over this, in this church family, Lord, we speak life over them. Thank you, Father. We declare that your word does not return void. But I thank you that the promises and the words that have been spoken, I thank you that those words, every promise, is coming to pass, and it's coming to pass now. Where there is heaviness, I thank you there's freedom. Where there's been uh, enemy reports that have been sown, I declare that those thoughts would be uprooted in the name of Jesus. Father, we declare that the best is yet to come. We declare the blessing is working in their lives, and it's working now. We declare the anointing is working in them, and it's working in them now, and it's working in them mightily. It's perfecting their lives. It's working in their finances. I thank you, Lord, that obstacles are being removed. Father, we declare, as, as, as those that are prophets and priests, we declare, like Isaiah said, there was no one that would say restore. We say restore. We say restore. We say restore. Hallelujah. We declare spirit man rise up. Hallelujah. We declare prosperity come, come now. Increase, increase come now. Hallelujah. We declare the enemy is under our feet. And we declare, Father, hallelujah, that you are, you are exceedingly, exceedingly abundantly above all we could ask, think, dream, or imagine. We declare the enemy is defeated. Thank you, Father. We win. You always cause us to triumph. Hallelujah. We are the head and not the tail. We are above only and not beneath. Hallelujah, we declare that our enemy has been smitten and he has to flee. He has to leave. One can chase a thousand, but can two put with ten thousand to flight. So enemy, you leave. You leave. Hallelujah. Torment, you leave. Fear, you leave. Coronavirus, you cease and desist. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you. Hallelujah. Amen, amen, amen. Somebody shout amen. Amen. All right, now listen, he, he quoted it in his prayer, a portion of it. 2 Corinthians 2.14. Now thanks be unto God, which causes us to triumph always in Christ Jesus. When do we start thanking him? Now thanks be unto God. Now thanks be unto God. Come on, give him thanks now. Thanks be unto God which causes us to triumph 
in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. 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 Thank you, gentlemen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. You can be seated. Praise God. Well, we just got some kingdom business done. Hallelujah. Amen. I want to welcome all of you that are watching by live stream. Thank you for joining us today. Today is the first time we've had more than 10 people in the service in quite some time. We've got a lot of our leadership here uh, in the audience. They're scattered all over the place. And uh, if everything goes according to plan, we will have our first service open to our uh, members and so forth the first week of June. That's our plan unless something changes, unless the governor says no or whatever. That's our plan. And so uh, be aware of that and be praying for us. Praise God. And of course, those of you that are watching from all over the world, uh, you may not be able to come, but continue to watch. Praise God. It's going to be exciting and we're going to have some good times in the Lord. Hallelujah. Well, I've got a great announcement to make to you. Yesterday at 11.09 a.m., I became a great-grandfather. <laughs> Hallelujah. Mark James, my grandson, the oldest grandchild, Mark James and his precious wife, Rachel, had a little baby girl yesterday at 11.09, weighed eight pounds and five ounces, and they named her Liberty Carolyn Savelle. And uh, I've got pictures of her, but I promised uh, Rachel that I wouldn't post any of them until she gets out of the hospital and she gets to do it first. But she is beautiful, hallelujah. Oh, I can hardly wait. In fact, I'm flying out to Alabama on Tuesday morning to go see my great granddaughter. Hallelujah. And I plan to hold her in my arms and say, Liberty, I'm your great grandfather. You picked the right family to be born into because I'm extremely blessed and highly favored. And as soon as I get back home, I'm going to contact my CPA and start you a trust fund. Hallelujah. Amen. Now I got a whole lot of grand, great grandchildren to come. And I'm going to do this for each and every one of them. And I plan to live to see them all born. Praise God. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Hallelujah. That's exciting, isn't it? Yes. Great grandfather. My, my, my. Open your Bibles, if you will, first of all, this morning to Deuteronomy chapter 7. Deuteronomy chapter 7. I want to talk to you this morning about the faithfulness of God. And for the sake of a title, I'm saying for right now and through the rest of this journey this year, that through it all, God has been faithful. God has been faithful. That's one of my favorite things about God. I, I usually put that in every letter I write. I want to remind people that God is faithful. I learned about the faithfulness of God over 50 years ago, and it became the foundation to my life of faith. Faith in His faithfulness. Amen. You can build your foundation on that. If you're not convinced yet that God is faithful, then you're going to struggle with your faith until you are convinced that God is faithful. The Bible says that he's not a man that he should lie. Amen. It's impossible for God to lie. He is the original promise keeper. Can you say amen? And I want to talk to you quite a bit about his faithfulness this morning. But first of all, let's read from Deuteronomy chapter 7. And verse 9, know therefore, now let me stop right there. 
Whenever the Bible says know something, make a point to know it. It's important. It's vital. Amen. You know, uh, when, when, when my dad would want to say something to me as a young boy that he wanted to get over to me, boy, are you listening? You listening to me, boy? I grew up being called Bubba. My, my sister still calls me Bubba. When I received my doctorate years ago, my dad started calling me Dr. Bubba. <laughs> and uh, he would say to me, son, are you listening? Boy, are you listening? I want you to know this. And he said it in somewhat of a stern way. But my dad was a loving man. He, he very compassionate man. But he wanted me to, he wanted to be sure that I understood what he was about to say. Okay. Amen. Amen. I remember, you know, growing up, my dad raced automobiles and we, we spent a lot of time on racetracks. And of course, I loved racing. I loved speed. And I'm not talking drugs, I'm talking horsepower. I don't know anything about that other speed. You'll have to ask Jesse to plant us about that. I don't, I don't know. Jesse said he took trips and never left his living room. But anyway, uh, <laughs> the speed I'm talking about was horsepower. And uh, dad always saw to it that everything I owned was fast. And when I had uh, got my first 57 Chevrolet and, and dad souped up the engine, you know, and, and uh, made it faster than stock. And he told me, he said, no son, if I ever catch you drag racing in the streets, I'm gonna take the car away from you. I said, okay, dad, you won't catch me. <laughs> he said, what? I said, no, I meant, uh, yes, sir, I understand. <laughs> but what I really meant was, you're not going to catch me, you know. And uh, it's just, it was just more fun racing in the streets. Can I get an amen from anybody that used to race in the streets? <laughs> amen. And later I raced on the drag strip, but it was more fun racing in the streets. And so us guys who had fast cars, we had a place out on West 70th, that hadn't been developed yet. And we laid out a quarter mile. And that's what we'd all go to race on Friday and Saturday night, if the police were not there. And sometimes we got it done just before they showed up. And uh, dad's rule was, now boy, you listening to me? If I catch you racing in the streets, I'm gonna take the keys away from you. Well, that meant when I was in high school, if I got the keys taken away from me, I had to ride that stupid school bus to school and I got the hottest 57 Chevrolet in town. And so I did not want to get caught. But I'd come home some evenings, Saturday night, late. Dad'd be sitting in the den and I'd walk in and he'd say, did you beat that 64 Impala tonight? I said, what 64 Impala? He said, the one you raced on at the end of 70th Street the white one had the red interior, had a 327. I said, Dad, how do you know all this? He said, son, I work on every cop's car in this town. They know your car. And they call me and say, Jerry's racing in the streets again. I'd reach in my pocket, throw him the keys, walk to my bedroom. I thought, I gotta ride that stupid bus in the morning. And I'd get in bed, and it wouldn't be 15 minutes. The light would flip on. And my dad would say, that thing will run, one boy, and throw me the keys back, you know. <laughs> and his punishment lasted all of 15 minutes, you know. But he wanted me to understand something. Son, we've spent a lot of money building this car up to where you want it. Don't destroy it in five minutes racing in the streets, you know, because I had done that before. So he would say, do you understand me? So I picture God saying, or using Moses to say, know therefore that the Lord thy God, look at your neighbor and say, are you listening? listening. He wants you to know something. Know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant. 
Now, if you don't know this by now, you're a little behind. That's one of the first things you should learn, that God is faithful. Say it with me. My God God is the faithful God. God. Say, my God God is the faithful God God. and the covenant-keeping God. Look at your neighbor and say, did you know that? (laughs) Apparently a lot of Christians don't. And this is basic. This is elementary. In fact, hold your place right there and let's go to Hebrews 11 real quick. Hebrews chapter 11. And look at verse six. For without faith, It is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is. That he is what? Number one, that he is God and that he is the faithful God, the covenant keeping God, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So once again, this is basic. This is faith 101. Amen. If you don't know that God is the faithful God, the covenant-keeping God, then as I said earlier, you're going to wind up struggling with your faith until this becomes a revelation to you. Now, after fulfilling his promise to the children of Israel about bringing them out of Egypt, Moses declares that if he did this, then he will keep his word to you Anytime he gives you his word. If God's ever kept his word once, that sets a pattern. He will keep his word forever. Amen. He'll keep his word forever. Now the word faithful in the little Hebrew means that you can count on. You can lean on and you can build upon this revelation that God is faithful. You can build on that, build a foundation on it. Now, I'm going to take the time to read some notes that I wrote last night. And the reason I'm going to read them is because I don't want to overlook any of you. When we are instructed in the scriptures to know something, as this verse begins with, then we need to make sure that we know this and that it is truly a revelation to us. It's a revelation to us. So the Bible is telling us that our God always fulfills what he says. He's true to his word. His promises stand sure and firm. To know this is to truly know him. Let me say that again. To know this is to truly know him. Amen. If you're not sure that God will keep his word, then I'm not sure you truly know him. Amen. To know that God is faithful is to know him. That's his nature. That's the essence of God. Amen. He has bound himself to rigidly observe every promise that he has made. One great theologian said, God never begins without completing. He never begins something without completing it. He will never abandon what he has said. His divine nature will not allow it. Every time the Bible says that God declared these words, I will, then you can be assured he will. Go with me to Psalm 145 for a moment. Psalm 145. Look at verse beginning in 15. The eyes of all wait upon thee, and thou givest them their meat in season, due season. Thou openest thine hand, and satisfy the desire of every living thing. The Lord is gracious in all his ways, holy in all his works. The Lord is nigh unto all them that call upon them, uh, call upon him, to all that call upon him in truth. He will, 
Say he will. He will fulfill the desire of them that fear him or reverence him. He also will hear their cry and will save them. Notice how many times the word will is mentioned in those couple of verses. It didn't say he can, even though he can, but it takes it a little further, a little deeper. He will. Amen. He not only can, but he will. I remember years ago, uh, oh, it had to be around 1970, about a year after I'd come to the Lord. I was in my room, bedroom, just reading and meditating and, and reading these verses. And I heard the Lord say, the Bible is not as much a revelation of what I can do as it is a revelation of what I will do. Now we know the Bible teaches us what God can do, but the emphasis is what he will do. The Bible is the written will of God and the will of God is what he will do. Can you say amen? You know, once again, uh, I make reference to my dad. My dad uh, was in the automotive business. He built race cars. He built, uh, he, he uh, restored classic automobiles. He restored or in, and built uh, wrecked cars and so forth, made them look like they'd never been wrecked. Well, what I grew up thinking, and I believed it, what my dad didn't know about automobiles they hadn't invented yet. He was, he was a master. And uh, I wanted to learn everything he knew about working on cars. Now, I, I excelled in the body work, paint and body work. He always told me I was a better painter than he was. But I never, I never got to the level of his knowledge and ability where the mechanics of it is concerned. In fact, I, 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 could, I could rebuild it from a wreck, make it look like it never been wrecked. I say, now, Dad build that engine for me, you know? And I, I, I knew some things, but he, he just, he could just listen to it and knew exactly what was wrong with it, you know? And I, I never got to that place in the mechanics of it, but I excelled in the paint and body work. And my, my attitude was, because he was so good at it, when I saw a wrecked automobile, I remember you know, younger age, when I'd be on the school bus and be coming home and we'd come up on a, a wreck. One time we'd come up on a, a, a wreck, a, a train had hit an automobile and it just demolished that automobile and, and uh, the people inside, they were quickly put in an ambulance and taken to the hospital. I don't know what their outcome was, but that car was totaled out, needless to say. And I'm looking at the car and I turned to my friend who was sitting next to me and I said, there's one my daddy can fix. He said, there's no way that car could ever be repaired. I said, if my daddy got a hold of it, he could repair it. Yeah. Why did I believe that? Because I watched him do it so many times. I mean, I just didn't think that it could get wrecked so bad that my daddy couldn't repair it. In fact, I proved that because I bought a lot of wrecked cars and brought them home to him and said, Daddy, fix it. <laughs> you know? And not one time did he ever say, Son, I'm tired of fixing your wrecks. Daddy could and Daddy would. Amen. I remember when, when my daughters were born and when they were just little girls, uh, anytime something broke, a toy, Terry, Terry Lynn would especially come up to me and say, Daddy, fix it. Daddy, fix it. And I would fix it. And she'd go off playing with it and never think twice about it. But if something else tore up, she never asked me, Daddy, can you fix this? Can you repair this? She just looked at me and said, Daddy, fix it. She had confidence, not only my ability, but my willingness to do it. Amen. Not one time did I ever say, Terry, I'm tired of fixing your junk. I'm, I'm tired of fixing everything you tear up. No, she knew I could and she knew I would. 
In fact, it hadn't been a few years ago. Uh, she had an accident in her car, and they repaired it at the body shop where she took it, the dealership. And when she came over to the house after she picked it up, and when she got out, I noticed the door was dropping when she opened the, the, the driver's side. The door was dropping. I said, Terry, didn't you just get this car repaired? It got hit on that left side. I said, didn't you just get this out of the shop? She said, Daddy, I just got it out of the shop. But something's wrong with this door. I said, she said, I know, Daddy. You can fix it. <laughs> Daddy, fix it. She went in the house, spending, you know, time talking to her mother. I'm outside working on her door. When she came back, it was working fine. I had a little secret. You know, tricks of the trade, praise God. And uh, it was working perfectly. She said, Daddy, you still can fix it. I said, I'm Daddy. <laughs> and daddies fix things, amen? Well, God is my Daddy. And he fixes things, praise God. Can you say amen? amen. Look at your neighbor and say, my God can. My God can. And my God, my God will. Now, see, that's, that's taking it deeper. You know, when I first came to the Lord, I didn't know these things. And uh, I would hear people say quite often, Christian people in the church where we were going. And they would say things like, our God is able. But it was very seldom I ever heard anybody say, and he will. They don't say, my God is able. And one day I told Carolyn, I said, I'm going to go ask those people. The next time they say, our God is able, I'm just going to go up and ask them, did he? And she'd say, Jerry, don't embarrass me. I said, I'm not going to embarrass you. I just, you know, inquiring minds want to know. <laughs> and these were full gospel, Pentecostal people, you know, and and uh, the pastor would have in the evenings, Sunday evening testimony services, but it would always turn out with something bad the devil did and right at the end, but we all know our God is able, bless his holy name, hallelujah. <laughs> but they never said, and he did, and he will. And I always wanted to know, well, did he? I mean, wouldn't that be a greater testimony? Amen. And so one day I went up to this person and I said, you said tonight that God was able. I want to know one thing. Did he? Did he what? I said, did he do what you said he was able to do? This is the answer I got. No, you never know what God will do. I thought, well, and I'm, I'm not three months old in the Lord. I thought, well, if you read the Bible, wouldn't you know what God will do? And now, of course, I'm being labeled fanatic. <laughs> uh, I wasn't the most popular person in our church. <laughs> you know, I, I, didn't, I didn't want to just sit there. Amen, amen, hallelujah. I got questions. These are the people that have been praying for me that I've surrendered my life to the Lord and now they're upset because I'm too surrendered. Yeah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> there was one guy, he was just come home from four years of Bible school and he was the, you know, he was the, uh, uh, the, the, Oh, the, the one they were going to promote and make something out of in this church. And he come home and all he was was a carbon copy of that Bible school. And he'd get so mad at me because I was, I was taking young people out in the streets, witnessing, praying for people. We're getting hippies saved, drug addicts saved, prostitutes saved, getting them delivered and set free. And he's still talking about it. And one day he grabbed me by the coat and picked me up. I mean, this guy was over six foot tall. He just picked me up. He'd been an athlete in high school, you know. And he just picked me up. And he said, I want to know one thing. 
why is God all, always doing this for you and he's not doing it for me? I said, put me down and I'll tell you. He put me down. I said, you know a lot about the Bible. I'm doing the Bible. Amen. 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 I mean, you, he could tell you what Paul was wearing on the road to Damascus because he had taken a course in Bible school called Roaming Through Romans. I never roamed through Romans. I just did what Romans said and figured God is faithful. And if he didn't mean what he said, then he shouldn't have put it in my copy of the book because once I find it, I'm going to do it and I'm going to expect him to honor it. Hallelujah. And he'd been doing it all these years. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. I'll never forget when this guy got turned around. I sent him a Kenneth Hagin tape. After I'd moved to Fort Worth, I sent him a Kenneth Hagin tape. Just, a, just a, a basic lesson like nobody else could teach on the subject of faith by Kenneth Hagin. And boy, I got a letter from that guy and you'd have thought it was the Apostle Paul writing that letter. He preached to me like I never heard any of this. And he wound up becoming a great word of faith preacher and Went home to be with the Lord some time back, but he was life completely turned around when he got a revelation of God is faithful. God is a covenant keeping God. Now, once again, it's important that we know this, know this. So I'm going to say it again. One great theologian said he cannot begin without completing God declared to us, to me, and I've conveyed it to you, that we are going to experience a brand new open door. And it's going to bring supernatural increase like never before. God would not begin something like that without completing it. That goes against his nature. He'll never abandon what he says his divine nature will not allow it. So once again, every time the Bible says, I will, when God says, I will, then he will. With him, there is no change of disposition. God is not willing to do something one day and he changed his mind while you were sleeping. Amen. There's no change of disposition. He is faithful and he's worthy of being trusted. No matter what our circumstances might be, he can be depended upon to do what he said he would do. Second Thessalonians chapter three, verse three says, but the Lord is faithful who shall establish you and keep you from evil. The Passion Translation says, he will guard you from the evil one. And the Message Translation says, he'll stick by you and protect you. Hallelujah. I'm standing on that right now. Amen. God will stick by me and protect me. Hallelujah. Now, I'm not doing things foolishly, you know. I'm, I'm, I'm honoring the social distancing and all of that, but I'm not in fear. I'm not in fear. I don't wash my hands 1,200 times a day. I have touched my nose. <laughs> I've even did this with my eyes. <gasps> I'm not living in fear. Right. Amen. Now, I'm, I'm doing what they asked me to do, but I'm not going to live in fear. Why? Because God says he'll stick by me and protect me. Yeah. And that's just one verse that says that. Yeah. And who is God? He's the faithful God. Right. He's the covenant keeping God. You can count on this truth. He is constant in performing all his promises. I touched my nose. No one is more dependable than our God. He will keep every promise until the end of time. Lamentations chapter three, verse 22 and 23 says, great is your faithfulness. That's one of my favorite songs. One of my old uh, favorite hymns, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Amen. So let's talk about what God promises 
to do for those in whom he has entered into covenant with. Let me give you a, a list here of just, uh, in, the, in a nutshell, what he has promised to do. Number one, he's promised to take care of those in whom he's entered into covenant with. He's promised to take care of those in whom he has entered into covenant with. Number two, he has promised to supply their needs or their necessities. Number three, he has promised to fulfill their desires. Number four, he has promised to deliver them from all their afflictions, troubles, and adversities. I'll go over them again in just a moment. And then number five, he has promised to never abandon them or to leave them hopeless or helpless. Now this is our faithful God who's made these promises. Our covenant keeping God. So once again, number one, he's promised to take care of those in whom he's entered into covenant with. Number two, he's promised to supply their needs or necessities. Number three, he's promised to fulfill their desires. Number four, he's promised to deliver them from their afflictions, troubles, and adversities. And number five, he's promised to never abandon them or to leave them hopeless or helpless. Can you say amen? amen. I thank you. I'll lift your hands and thank God for those great promises. Amen. And they certainly would be applicable right now, wouldn't they? Amen. His promises are irrevocable, never to be changed, never to be reversed. They are final. Go with me to Hebrews 6. Hebrews 6. Our God is the faithful God, the covenant-keeping God. In verse 13, for when God made promise to Abraham because he could swear by no greater he swear by himself, saying, surely, I love the way that starts, surely. How many of you like a sure thing? Surely, blessing, I will bless thee, multiplying, I will multiply thee, and after so, and, un, and so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men verily swear by the greater, an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife. In other words, you've been in a court of law or have you at least seen uh, on television uh, a series, a movie or something where they are in a court of law? And you know they'll ask you to raise your hand, your right hand, put your left hand on the Bible. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth so help you God? What are you doing? You're swearing by a greater you're swearing by a greater. You're acknowledging God is greater than you. But here it says, because there was no greater, he swore by himself. Wow. God, God can't turn to someone greater. He's the most high God. There's not a moster high. Amen. He's the most high God. So he swore by himself. And what he's saying is, I swear to you, Abraham, and to your seed, surely I'll bless you. It's a sure thing. I said, it's a sure thing. And the old phrase used to be, you can take it to the bank. I'm not sure that's a good phrase now, but you can take it to the bank. Amen. It's a sure thing. Hallelujah. And then notice it says, for men verily swear by the greater and an oath for confirmation of them an end of all strife, wherein God willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel. Immutability means not changeable, irrevocable. Confirmed it by an oath. So he swore by himself and then confirmed it by an oath that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hope, 
lay hold upon the hope that is set before us, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul. Hallelujah. Man, you ought, to, you ought to spend some time right there in those verses until you are totally convinced that it's impossible for God to lie. No matter what he has told you, he will back it. I, I like to picture it this way. I, I, sometimes I just close my eyes and I see through my mind's eyes, God standing in front of me. Jerry Savelle, I swear to you, I give you this oath. I will not let you fail. I will not leave you. I will not forsake you. I will not abandon you, even during a time of crisis. I swear, surely I'll bless you. And guess what? I've, I've been blessed through all this. I mean, I have really been blessed through all that we have gone through since March. In fact, I got a, a note from my accountant that we just had our finest April we have ever had in the history of this ministry. Hallelujah. Glory to God. God is faithful. God is faithful. And, I, and because of it, and because we tithed off of our income, both in the church and Jerry Seville Ministries, we've been able to give more and help more people, praise God. Hallelujah. Our giving has not stopped during this process. I haven't wrote one time and told people that I faithfully support every month. We can't do it anymore. Haven't had to write that letter. In fact, we've been supporting more people, more ministries. And I give all the glory to God. Hallelujah. Why? Because he is the faithful God. He's the covenant keeping God. Hallelujah. He swore unto me, I will bless you. And I don't care who says anything else about it. I'm going to be blessed. Hallelujah. Come on, give the Lord a shout if you believe that it's a sure thing. Amen. So you need to settle it in your heart once and for all that God is faithful. I want to make this point. I said it earlier. But if you're taking notes, I would strongly suggest you write this down. Develop strong faith in his faithfulness. This is a major key to victorious living. Develop strong faith in his faithfulness. I never have to question. God, are you really going to do this? Are you really going to do what you said? Now, in those early first couple of months, I didn't know God like I know him now. And I wasn't sure. I mean, I'm just now getting acquainted with God. But once I got to know him, <laughs> then that settled it. He's the faithful God. He's the covenant-keeping God. And my faith is not in Jerry Savelle's faith. My faith is in God's faithfulness. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. Hallelujah. So develop strong faith in his faithfulness because it is a major key to victorious living. And I'll drink to that. <clears throat> First Corinthians chapter one and verse nine, God is faithful through, him, through whom you were called in the fellowship of his son. First Thessalonians 5, 24. Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. Do what? He'll do whatever he's promised you. Amen. I know that I know without a shadow of doubt that God called me into this ministry. I heard the call 1957, November Thanksgiving Day, Oklahoma City in my grandmother's home. I didn't answer it then. It wasn't until 1969 that I answered it. But I knew from as far back as November 1957 that I had to call a God on my life. 
And I know that I know that I am called to do what I'm doing right now. Amen. And I know that I know that everything he's called me to do, he will make it happen. Somebody asked me one time, said, Brother Jerry, uh, I'd like to travel like you. Uh, I pastor now, but, uh, and the church is not doing real well. And I'd like to just shut it down and, and start traveling. Well, what makes you think you'd be a success at traveling? I've had the Lord say this to me. You know, I, I founded this church, but I'm not the senior pastor. Justin is. And he does a great job, I might add. Amen. I'm, I'm the founding pastor. I represent the apostolic authority. God has never allowed me to stop doing something when it wasn't working. The only time he's allowed me to make a shift or a change was when it was successful. Because God does not call you to fail. So I told that pastor, I said, well, you just told me that your church is failing, it's not doing well. Uh, is that what God called you to do, to start a church that's failing? No. Then you can't leave it until it's successful. Amen. I didn't, I didn't leave this church, you know, to travel all over the world and it was a mess and, and division and strife and nobody showing up. I handed it to him a success <laughs> and he's taking it to another level. Praise God. Amen. Can you say amen? amen? So God is faithful who has called you and who also will do it. Amen. Hebrews 11, 11. You know the story of Sarah, Abraham, when God told them that they would have a child, a son. His name would be Isaac. You can find all of this in Genesis 17 through Genesis 21. And when God told Sarah that she would have a son, even though it was impossible because her womb was dead. She was an old woman. It was impossible for Abraham. He was an old man. But God said they would have a son. And that his seed would produce a mighty nation. Amen. And the Bible says when Sarah heard it, she laughed. And God said, wherefore did you laugh? She laughed because it was so unbelievable. It was so impossible. But then God said, is nothing or is anything too hard for the Lord? And then the little Hebrew is El Shaddai. Is anything too hard for El Shaddai, the God in whom nothing is impossible? And he said to her, at the right time, and I'm paraphrasing, you will have that son. And if you read a little further, she had the son at the time, according to what God had spoken. Amen. You know, God is never concerned. What if I say this and it doesn't happen? Amen. Now, I, I, I'm a little, unless I know that I know that I know that I know that I really know that I know. <laughs> I'm a little hesitant to say, thus saith the Lord. I've had people come up and say, you have a word for me? <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm not going to make up a word. <laughs> now, there was one guy that called me three o'clock in the morning, Anaheim, California, woke me up and said, when are you coming down to the lobby? I said, I'm not coming down to the lobby. How'd you get my number? Well, I found out where you're staying, what room you're in. And the Lord told me in the meeting after you preached tonight that you were going to pay my house off. Now, when are you going to come down to give me the check? When are you going to obey God? I said, well, the Lord didn't say a word to me about that. So I think you miss God. 
He said, well, is the Lord saying something to you for me? I said, oh yeah, go home. <laughs> That's the word of the Lord. And I knew that I knew that I knew that I knew. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. I remember one time in a, another church we had started years ago, I, I felt such an, uh, an anointing that morning. Man, people were getting healed and so forth. And, and I, I, this was all before I got into my sermon. And I started to tell them where to open the Bible. And I said, the word of the Lord just came to me. And I said something. And I got interrupted by the Lord. He said, I didn't say that. I said, excuse me, folks. I turned my back on him. I said, Lord, that wasn't you that said what I just said? He said, no. I said, well, who was it? He said, it was you. I said, well, what do I do now? He said, tell them that wasn't me. I said, well, Lord, what are they going to think about me if I tell them it wasn't you? He said, they'll respect you for being honest. So I got up and I said, folks, I, I apologize. I let my emotions get involved and what I just said was not from the Lord. And I give you my word, I will never ever again say, thus saith the Lord, unless I know that I know that I know that it's thus saith the Lord. Yes. And I'm not going to say to you, the Lord told me that he's going to open a new door and spring about supernatural increases never before unless I knew that 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 I knew it was from the Lord. Amen. And he's faithful. Amen. It's a sure thing. Now the Bible says you need to mix faith with it that it might profit you. So stay in faith. Amen. Once again, don't ask how in the world could God bring supernatural increase to me in a time like this? His way was through the sea. That means he took the very situation and circumstances and used them to open this new door. When you call splitting a Red Sea, opening a new door. Nobody had ever been through the Red Sea like that before. Don't you know those children of Israel when Moses said, go forward? They're thinking, have you lost your ever-loving mind? We can't go forward. There's a sea out there. Now you got to remember, they didn't know that God could split a Red Sea. They'd never heard him do it before. They don't have Exodus to read. They're doing Exodus. They can't read about it. They're doing it. Amen. But you and I know that nothing is impossible to God because we can read Exodus and we can read the Psalms. His way was through the sea. God took the very thing that was trying to keep them back, hold them back, and used it to bring about a mighty deliverance. Hallelujah. And God's going to use this that we're going through right now. Amen. Amen. And turn it into something that he can use to bring about a mighty deliverance and bring about supernatural increase like we've never experienced before. And I think you ought to give him a great shout because of it. <laughs> Amen. Was that the best great shout you got? <clears throat> Amen. All right, now listen to this. 2 Timothy 2.13 he abideth faithful, for he cannot deny himself. The Passion Translation says, he never wavers in his faithfulness to us. Never wavers in his faithfulness to us. God is faithful. He's constant in performing all that he's promised. If you go back to Deuteronomy 7, you don't have to go there, but just as a reminder, if you go back to Deuteronomy 7, verse 9, where we read about his faithfulness, it goes on to say that he's faithful to a thousand generations. 
a thousand generations. We haven't experienced a thousand generations yet. Hallelujah. So this would include his faithfulness to you and me. Amen. The psalmist declares in Psalm 78, talking about the generations to come. That's you and me. And in verse seven of Psalm 78, he says that God is uh, faithful and that he will do what he said he would do so that we might set our hope in God. Hallelujah. The New International Version says that we might put our trust in God. God says in Psalm 89, 33, one of my favorite verses, I will not suffer my faithfulness to fail. The New International Version says, I will never betray my faithfulness. Hallelujah. Folks, we've got it made. We've got, a, we've got an oath given by God himself that he will never betray his faithfulness. Amen. And then verse 34 of that same chapter, my covenant will I not break nor alter the thing that is gone from my lips. Man, I have stood on that verse I don't know how many times and God has brought great victories when it looked like victory was in, impossible and I would, I would decree God's covenant, he will not break and he will not alter what has come from his lips and I kept decreeing it and kept decreeing it and watched God make it happen, hallelujah. Can you say amen? So a thousand generations, that means God has got us covered. No matter what we're going through now and no matter what we might go through in the future, God is faithful. Now, here's something I want to wrap it up with. I've learned over the years <clears throat> that when God is demonstrating his faithfulness, it also includes showing his favor. When God is demonstrating his faithfulness, it also includes showing his favor. Amen. Psalm 31 verse 21 says, Blessed be the Lord, for he has shown me his marvelous loving favor. He has shown me his marvelous loving favor. And the, the uh, translation I'm reading says, he showed me his loving favor when I was beset. And the word beset means attack on all sides. Hallelujah. If you feel like you're being attacked on all sides, get ready, get ready, get ready for some favor to show up. Hallelujah. The faithfulness of God. He's not going to abandon his faithfulness and he's getting ready to show you great favor. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Lift your hands and say, I receive it. I receive it. Now, Psalm 41 verse 11 says, by this I know that thou favorest me because my enemy does not triumph over me. I know I have the favor of God on my life and this is one of the reasons I know is because my enemy does not triumph over me. Another translation says, I know this, I know God's favor is on me because there are no victory shouts in the enemy's camp. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Somebody say, I got the favor of God. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. And now I'm talking about my favorite subject, the favor of God. Now, Psalm ver, uh, chapter 30, verse five from the Amplified says, his favor is for a lifetime. I've walked in it now for 51 years. Hallelujah. I was telling stories about favor back in the speaker's room this morning before we came out, some of which they had not heard before. Hallelujah. I've enjoyed the favor of God for 51 years. And now I know it's on my life for a lifetime. The New International Version says, his favor lasts a lifetime. Amen. So when you talk about the faithfulness of God, 
You can't exclude the favor of God. Amen. So I want to encourage you and challenge you to begin to believe for greater manifestations of God's favor right in the midst of this crisis. Hallelujah. Get up every morning declaring the favor of God is on me. It's on me for the rest of my life. Favor opens doors that no man can shut. Favor changes rules and regulations. Hallelujah. Favor causes me to be promoted when there are no promotions. Favor gives me a job when there are no jobs. Favor causes me to prosper when nobody's prospering. I got the favor of God. Hallelujah. Come on, give him your best shout. Hallelujah. Amen. Psalm 145 verse 8 says, The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and of great mercy. Another translation says, He is disposed to show favor. I love that. Amen. God's disposition never changes. Oh, but Brother Jerry, don't you know the Bible talks about the wrath of God? Oh, yeah, but that's not for you. That's for the wicked. Amen. The faithful never experience it. Amen. He's disposed to show favor. Amen. Hallelujah. You know, I've been hanging around God so long now. I'm disposed to show favor. Amen. I not only experience favor, I show favor. That's Psalm 112. Psalm 112 talks about the man with the established heart. It says he's dispersed, he's given, he's shown favor. See, God's blessed him, and because God's blessed him, he's able to show favor to others. Hallelujah. Praise God. You know, I think it's interesting. When all this began, I told Justin that I had established a special account for the church to help people in need while they're going through this. To help them with groceries, help them with, you know, housing bills and so forth. And, and, uh, and we've helped people with car payments and different things. And it's, I think it's very interesting and it shows me that people are becoming winners in life yes. because there's only been a handful of people who've needed help. Yes. Isn't that right? There's only been a handful of people in this church that have needed help. Sounds like to me, they're becoming winners in life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's good news. Amen. That's good news. It's working, Justin. Praise God. So, God is disposed to show favor. You say, well, I know, he, I know you experience favor, Brother Jerry, but I'm not you. Well, that doesn't make any difference because you need to read Psalm 145, verse 9. The Lord is good to all. Yeah. You're covered. Amen. Look at your neighbor and say, we're covered. We're covered. Hallelujah. The Lord is good to all. He is disposed to show favor to all. So stop letting the devil deceive you into thinking that you don't have a right to experience the same kind of favor that I experienced. The only difference between me and some of you, I expect it. I'm highly developed in it. Amen. I don't have to get up every morning and talk myself into it, talk myself into it, talk myself into it. I got it. (laughs) I know it. It's deep on the inside of me. Hallelujah. Start calling me Jerry, highly favored Savelle. Praise God. So I encourage you to start depending upon the faithfulness of God and along with it, the favor of God. Keys to victory, praise God. My next sermon to you, I've already got it ready and I'm going to call it, Are You Reigning or Just Maintaining? Are you reigning or just maintaining? 
God wants you to reign in life. You know, one of the great things is during all this time, I haven't traveled anywhere. The only place I've been is Eagle Mountain Church. I've helped Brother Copeland with his virtual victory campaigns. That's the furthest out of town I've been since March the 15th. My last church tour was March the 15th, Denver, Colorado. I've been home. Now, I haven't been just laying around sleeping. Man, I've been in the word of God. Hallelujah. I got, I got enough sermons for the rest of this year and half of next year. And I'm going to unload them all on you. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. Stand with me, if you will, please. Glory to God. Father, in the name of Jesus, I have delivered this word that you put on my heart this morning. And I pray that I've done so in a way that it has made a major impact in the lives of every person who heard it. Not only here in this auditorium, but people who are watching by live stream all over the world. And Lord, I pray, just like we started out with in Deuteronomy chapter 7, I pray that they will know, not just have heard about, not just have read about, but they will know it's a working revelation that our God is a faithful God. That our God is a covenant keeping God. Lord, I believe those are key issues right now for where we are and what we're going through. People who know, truly know that God is a faithful God and that he is a covenant keeping God, then they will not have to worry. They'll not have to fear. They'll not have to fret. They'll not have to be concerned. They can get up every day lifting their hands and praising God because they know if God is faithful, then he's also disposed to show favor. And God is about to open a new door and supernatural increase will come as never before. Lord, you are making a way through the sea right now in the name of Jesus and we receive it and we rejoice in it and give the Lord a great shout. Amen. Praise God. Oh, what an awesome word today. Do you receive that today? You know, maybe you, uh, you're watching us today and you came across us on Facebook or YouTube and you've never really heard a message like this concerning God's faithfulness or that God cares about you, that God wants to dispose good in your life. So if you've, if you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, today's your day. Yes. Don't, don't leave this broadcast today or this, uh, this service today. If, if something's pricked in your heart today and maybe you need to make things right with God, Maybe you've been operating and battling in, in fear what's going on and you came across this broadcast today and yet hope was built on the inside of you. Well, the first step to a changed life, what Dr. Still talked about, that, that it, this is about covenant. And those that are in covenant are those that made Jesus the Lord of your life. And so today, I want to give you an opportunity. Pray this prayer with, with us today. Father God, thank you for sending Jesus. Thank you that Jesus died on the cross for me. Lord, forgive me of my sins. I repent of all my sin. I repent for trying to do things my own way, creating, going after my own path. I surrender my life to you today. I step into the new door of salvation. Thank you, Lord, for making me a new creation. In Jesus' name, in Jesus. Amen. amen. If you pr pray, pray that prayer today, could you email us at info at heritageoffaith.com and we want to connect with you and give you some steps on, on how you too can win in life, amen? Uh, those that are, if you can go ahead and be seated, those that are here, we're going to receive our tithes and our offerings. Um, you know, you can follow the, get different give, giving instructions online, uh, whether it's on our website or whether it's text to give. Um, but as you're preparing to give, there was a scripture that came of my heart yesterday and just praying over today. 
And it was kind of interesting. The scripture was when Jesus was speaking to the disciples in Matthew chapter 14, and he made a statement. He said, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. And I said, Lord, what, what does this have to do with offering, you know? And, and he kept saying, beware of the leaven of the of the Pharisees. And Jesus goes on and talks to them and the disciples are kind of f- confused. It's like, it's because we didn't bring any bread and, and, and all that. But then Jesus says it again, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. And then he actually says, beware of the teaching of the Pharisees. I want to encourage you, what, what, what was Jesus telling us there? See, what is leaven? Leaven is, is almost like a seed that is sown. It is a thought that's sown that permeates and that spreads. Now, what does that have to do with our offering today? And what does it have to do? What I want to communicate to you is because just what Dr. Lowe talked about, the faithfulness of God, that God wants to do good in your life, that God wants to show favor in your life, but yet, yet teaching, maybe religious teaching, religious concepts, maybe other people can sow a seed that would do what? Hinder the seed that was just sown into your heart. You know, the, the, he said, beware the teaching of the Pharisees. See, the Pharisees were more interested in tradition than truth. And so as you prepare to give today, I want you to be focused on truth. Don't allow maybe things you've heard about what God wants to do, what God could do. That question, well, God's only faithful to some and not faithful to others. No, that would be a, that would be leaven. That would be the leaven of the Pharisees that you have to do, that you have to do. No, hey, we came in because because of Christ and we've been set free because of Christ. And it's the grace of, Paul said, it's the grace of God, I am what I am. But yet because of this grace and because of what God's done in my life, out of my overflow of my heart of gratitude, what God's, God's done in my life, I bring of my tithes and my offerings. So don't let tradition. Don't let, don't let wrong seeds or wrong thoughts about God. That's what leaven is of the Pharisees. It's thoughts that don't line up with God's word. It's thoughts that don't line up with God's character or God's heartbeat. So don't let the enemy sow seeds of doubt about what God can do in your life. And don't let, let the enemy sow seeds that will keep you from knowing what God will do in your life. God cares about you. So as you give today, focus on the truth of God's word. One, he wants to prosper you. Two, every seed reproduces ever its own kind. Three, he loves a cheerful giver whose heart and is his giving. And last thing, it says, honor the Lord with your substance and says your barns will burst forth. See, that is truth. So don't let the enemy come with other thoughts. Well, you know, you don't need to tithe today. You don't need to sow today. It's it's not, God, it's not about giving. No, we understand, hey, what God does and how his kingdom operates. So let's, let's pray over our giving today. Father, we just thank you that we have opportunity to sow in your kingdom. I thank you that you are faithful. And I thank you that you will watch over your word to perform it. As we are being doers of the word, as we are aligning ourselves with this spiritual law of seed time and harvest, I thank you, Father, that we rest, that you bring about increase in our lives. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank, thank you for your continued faithfulness and your giving. Amen. Hallelujah. As, as before we dismiss uh, this morning, uh, I'm going to encourage you um, about a few announcements. Uh, just like Dr. Savell said at the beginning of his message uh, before he started, how June 7th is our plan on when we're going to start having two services again. Now, make sure you, 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 you connect with us. You read our emails that we send out, uh, social media. Make sure you connect with those things because there might be certain instructions uh, on what you need to do because depending on what Governor Abbott, uh, you know, communicates, whether, you know, we can have 50% occupancy or, or whatever it might be, we're still trying to keep so social distancing in place. And so that causes us to be limited with each service, each service. So we want to encourage you, make sure you stay connected with us as we release more information. Um, also, man, exciting news today, but the Heritage Worship album was released today on iTunes and Spotify. So I encourage you, you know, on whatever you get your music from, you know, if you have an iPhone, you can go to iTunes store and there you can go there, type in Heritage Worship and look for Give Them Jesus. 
Jesus and download it today because the many people who download it today, it puts us farther up in charts that will get that, that album in other people's hands or put it in front of their eyes so they can see it. Uh, and also tonight, we're going to be having a, a, uh, an acoustic worship in the parking lot tonight. And, and, and so tonight we have these shirts called Give Them Jesus and encourage you. They're one for $25 or two for 20. And it's not something for us to necessarily profit from as a church. It's something that's going to go back into other things that we do as a church as it pertains to worship, music, and, and so forth. So I encourage you, be here tonight. Um, did I say something wrong? <laughs> so, <laughs> Um, you know, at, at 5.15, the doors uh, o- open up, and um, I think I said t- one, did I say that again? Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, one for 25 or two for 40. There we go. I just said it right. Thank you all. Just, yes, yes. I said that right. Thank you very much. I think someone else needs to do this. I mean, um, also, so tonight the parking lot gates will open at 515. Um, also, we are going to be practicing social distancing tonight. Uh, one thing we, we endeavor to do, but because of shipping things, they weren't able to get our FM transmitter to us. So you're not going to be able to tune into your FM station to hear the worship tonight. So, so what you can do is you can bring chairs and just kind of stay in the vicinity of your car. You can put your chair in the front of your car, put your head out of your sunroof or whatever. Um, but we will have someone going around and, and, and selling the t-shirts and we will not have restrooms available um, just because of the social distancing and those things within our building and so forth. So, um, but, but it will be a, it's not going to be long. It's going to be from about six to about 40 or 45 minutes long. We'd love to see your faces. Um, love you connect with us tonight, get back on our property. And we want you to know how much we love you. And really, it's just been a great time uh, just having you in your parking lot tonight. So once again, uh, the gates open at 550 for that. Amen. Other than that, we love you. God bless and give him Jesus.